Welcome to Dr. Roger and Friends, the bright side of longevity, hosted by three Ps in a podcast, Doc Roger, Teresa, and Danielle. Thanks for joining us for Coffee and Conversation. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm here with my two co-hosts, Danielle and Teresa. How are you ladies today? Great. You look great. It's uh, we're having a great fall in New England. You know, we all live in different areas, uh, California, Florida and, and Cape Cod, Cape uh, New England. Oh, it's absolutely gorgeous. So, so how are you guys doing with weather? It's a little foggy and cool here, but it's a refreshing change from the humidity. <laughs> yeah, Florida, foggy and cool. Wow. I like it. But the bread basket up there in San Joaquin Valley and Fresno, that must be nice. Yeah, it's a little foggy too, actually. The- oh, really? Oh, you you yeah. sometimes have these huge pileups on 99, don't you? Yeah. Uh, with fog and it's like funny 200, that it's, 200 yes. cars or something. Yes. Jeez. It's funny that someone who lives so far away knows that. But you, you've also lived close, right, Roger? So. Yeah. I was almost involved in one once. Oh, I went to your house. Oh, boy. Well, talk about pileups. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, we, we all today we got a we're building on a previous podcast that had to do with self coaching, I guess, for want of a better word, but how we navigate through the world, uh, particularly with our heads being the way they are, and and how we see ourselves. And I, I love that one, but we wanted to build on it. So we all share the fact that we're human, right? And so there's some core characteristics of who we are as humans, but each one of us is kind of unique, Very, not kind of, we are unique in our experiences and how we see the world, How, but really importantly, how we see ourselves, because we're, aren't we learning that that view of ourselves, call it anything, self-concept, self-beliefs, mindset, all of those things uh, that apply to that, that makes a huge difference in our success and failure as how we navigate the world and deal with troubles and stress and whether we're successful or how we see ourselves. It's huge. So I think we all we're all nodding. And I think we we, we should definitely drill down deeper into that idea of how we see ourselves. Maybe we can put some some uh, some paint on, on the canvas regarding this, you know, get it a little more tangible because it's kind of an abstract concept. So I'm going to, Teresa, you, you, you must be ready to go. I I'm ready to go. I know Daniel is too. Yeah. Let's go. Um, <laughs> yes. And, and people, I think people by and large recognize it too. Like um, I just wrote a, a blog called how to get out of your own way. And I titled it that because many, many people who come to me for coaching, this would be widowed people will say, here's the problem. And, and here's what I want for myself, but the obstacle is me. And I can't, I can't get out of my own way. I'm the problem. I'm the obstacle. And so I think there's some awareness of, of like, I am my worst enemy. And I think people realize too, that they're their own worst judge. Um, there, there's so much we could, we could talk about here. Danielle, is that your experience as well? Uh, absolutely. And it's funny because I coach a completely different population. They're usually um, career changers, people writing books and, and uh, launching podcasts. And, but it's the same thing of, you know, getting out of their own way and, and that whole self-regard, like, I'm not good enough to be doing this. Who do I think I am to be doing this? So this is a great, great conversation. You know, we all share something in common. We've all written books. And uh, I know my experience was I wrote a book, you know, live long, die short about healthy longevity that it took a long time to get started with that because I was talking negatively to myself. I mean, there's so many good books out there. What can I add to this? There's the little literature on this. And that was a huge stumbling block. And thankfully it wasn't one I couldn't penetrate, but I needed a little help to penetrate it. And it's related specifically to books, Roger, but it can relate to anything. People ask me, how long did it take to write your, your trilogy? And I'm like, well, the first one, five years, the second one, six months, the last one, four months. And the biggest thing, stumbling block, not just yourself, but the, 
this is the way you have to do it. This is the way it's always been done. These are the rules for how to write a book. And you could take that and put that in any context. Like these are the rules of the world. And if you don't follow them, you're doing it wrong. And it's getting out of those ideas that you're doing it wrong. Now, I don't want to get us off track, but I know it's related. You've all heard the term, we choose to be happy. You know, so, I mean, even as something as basic as happiness, which I think most of us feels comes from the outside world, is really a question of how we view the world and the decisions we make and how we view the world. So something even as basic as that. Well, why don't we start breaking it down, uh, this whole, all of these self beliefs or, or self-concepts, why don't we break them down to, to get some meat on this, this topic? Yeah. And I would contend that happiness and, and any other emotion is an inside job. It, environment matters, where we live matters, all of that does matter, but it creates an environment where we're more likely to think certain thoughts that lead to certain feelings. So I, I personally think every feeling is an inside job. And for sure, if we're in our own way, thinking negative thoughts about ourselves, doubting ourselves, having those limiting beliefs floating around in our subconscious, mind you, because we've thought them so often that in the spirit of efficiency, the brain files them away in the subconscious. So we don't even really think them uh, word for word so they can get really hidden. It's hard to dig them up, but we surely operate according to them. And, and so at this, I think what we're trying to do today is help people dig up their beliefs that aren't in their conscious mind. So a lot of what comes up in coaching for me is basically self-regard and how people think about themselves, which is not the same as self-esteem. Self-esteem is I have confidence. I am great, but you need to have the tools to back it up or else you don't even believe what you're saying. Um, Self-regard is about being able to equally see these are my strengths. These are my opportunities for growth or areas where there's a little weakness and have a clear sight and love yourself anyway and treat yourself with compassion anyway. Um, and when we lack that self-regard, we lack that self-compassion, that's when we get into the, why bother? Nothing's going to change. I can't do this and I'm not motivated to change. So self-regard is just a, a huge, developing that to me is a huge first step in accomplishing what you want to accomplish, feeling the way you want to accomplish. And Roger, as you're saying, finding the happiness and joy that you're seeking. Mm -hmm. Isn't, uh, you know, it, so it really starts at the basics as to how you see yourself. You know, what, what is your identity in, in the world? We all have labels where husbands, wives, you know, professionals, uh, children, you know, sons and daughters, fathers, sons, all of that. But beyond that, who we are. And, uh, you know, as you were saying, you know, the, the, the self-regard might some people be stumbled over thinking, depending upon how they were raised uh, with humility, confusing this with humility versus being, you know, haughty or proud or, or obsessed with yourself. That probably is a barrier to being able to see yourself more accurately. Do you think? I have, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, when I, uh, you know, I, I talk a lot about positive psychology and the work of Barbara Fredrickson and when leading mindfulness groups there, are, she talks about these, all these components to happiness, joy, awe, wonder. And she mentions pride. And whenever I say pride, people are like, oh, but pride is bad. But in the, the context that we're talking about is you can take joy and say, I did this and feel good about it without it being that boastful. And oftentimes the pride that we think of when we think of uh, the negative context is there's nothing to back it up. It's, I am great. I have this confidence, but the, I have nothing. There's no, no, no substance behind it. And here that's different to me than when you accomplish something and you can say, wow, I did that. You know, Kaitsen can help us with that. You know, if you if you have something big you want to do and you fail all the time doing something big, it's like we've talked about with change. Uh, if you do it in small steps, or the Kaitsen method, you can be proud of that small step, you know, and build build on that. I'm, I'm sure that's probably a, a way to or at least one way to overcome that. But I know Teresa's got something. She's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Research suggests that we think about 60,000 thoughts a day, which is a lot of thoughts, um, and, that, and that there's perhaps an 80% negativity bias that's happening. 
right? That's our primitive brain doing its job, keeping us alive. So it can be really easy to say there are no wins. There's just failure. I've screwed this up. I'm not who I could have been, right? It could it could be that record that just plays in our head. And, and if that's true, that only means that you have a normal human brain functioning correctly, primitive, primitive brain, right? So that's okay. With my clients, we, we on purpose twice a week, articulate what the wins are. Um, what are you proud of? What was hard, but you did it anyway. And it could be so small and it could be so big, but it's training the brain to change that channel, right? And seek what you are proud of the genuine things that you are proud of. Cause, cause most people who I interact with are not boastful. In fact, they're the opposite. They're like, I'm screwing this up. Um, so it's a good practice to document your wins. Why don't we do that? We should do that and celebrate them. And this is related to self-compassion, isn't it? Because we fail. And if when we fail, we throw in the towel and say, I'm garbage and can never do this and put the picture of a pig on my refrigerator, you know, uh, that, that sort of thing. That's very detrimental, I think, to, uh, to success, isn't it? Because we make failure mean something about us. Right. And it's just failure, you know, which we all do. It's not about our character, right? Is that yeah. basically? It's a fail. It doesn't mean I'm a failure. And in fact, if you believe that you learn more from failure, right, then we should be, that could be our currency. We could be hungry to fail because of the lessons learned and never does it make us a failure. What did Edison say? You know, he invented the light bulb and he tried 10,000 times and they say, how how, how, how did you do that? I mean, he said, well, I just, you know, I didn't fail. I had 10,000 ways to not build a light bulb, you know? Exactly. <laughs> so, a lot of that, um, what I love about say appreciative inquiry does exactly what Teresa suggested. When you have somebody think any, any time frame, something that happened in your life, that was just a wonderful experience. It doesn't even have to be a success, just a wonderful experience. And guaranteed, as they're talking about it, they're getting excited. They were involved in that experience in a way that they were proud of how they showed up. And it gets people thinking about what their strengths are. And that's a hard thing to ask when, when you're talking about people with low self-regard or low self-efficacy, meaning they don't think they can do it. To be able to ask them, what strengths do you see in yourself? How would your friend describe you? If you're not sure and you asked a friend, how would they describe you? And then just kind of holding a mirror up to some of those, those good things. Because I, I, I do think we're in a culture that's we're more likely to look at our bad things. Yeah, well, that, don't we know that people who uh, look at the world as half full live much longer, seven and a half years or more longer? I'm sure it's related to this. And, and it's, you know, it's not that they do everything supremely well or anything or that the world is beautiful all the time or the world is just all the time. I mean, we all know that's not true. But if they look through a lens and it's not being Pollyanna. Anyway, if we're not Pollyanna about it, and but it is, there's nothing to say. We can't just look at the positive side of thing and choose to not focus on the negative, as you said before, Teresa. Masterpiece is driven by data and powered by content. Maximizing healthy longevity is achievable at all times with the right metrics and content, enabling informed decisions. Powered by Masterpiece can support your community in the critical areas of focus that drive healthy longevity for your residents, staff, and community. Learn more at MyMasterpieceLiving.com. It's never been easier, I don't think, in society to compare and despair, you know, because social media is so, is so in our faces and everyone's highlight reel looks so perfect. And it's very, our, our brains very naturally want to put things into two quick categories, right or wrong, right? So the, so the compare and despair happens so readily. So it takes, I, I would offer maybe that it takes more effort these days to, to see the glass half full than, than maybe it did before. 
Wow, that's that's a good point. Jeez, my goodness. Uh, it seems like we're in the technology.